is for the purpose of providing more relevant advertising. Things you're more likely to click on products you're more likely to buy, because that's how all of these free online services, Google, Facebook, Twitter, Prezi, etc., this is how they support themselves, by having relevant ads, and that's just the way economics work. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just, it's just the way the system works. So how much money are we talking about? For Facebook, for example, per year, per user, they make about this, about the price of one cup of coffee. Now, when you multiply that by the total number of Facebook users, that's a huge amount of money. When you think about it on an individual level, just you as a person, all of your family connections, your friends, your professional colleagues, your interests, your um, medical history, your hobbies, your Facebook is worth $4 and some change. Maybe then it gets a little scary, and that's where people start getting a little worried about these issues. Um, because companies like Google and Facebook and many others can collect personal data based on IP address, even if you don't have an account with the company, and sometimes even if you're not logged in. Facebook um, can get information anytime you visit a website that has a Facebook Live button on it. You don't have to click the button, the button just has to be present on the page. And Google will collect information uh, anytime you use any Google service, including YouTube. And you cannot opt out of the, of the data collection. You can opt out of seeing the personalized ads, but you can't opt out of the data collection. And Google, of course, doesn't just use it for advertising. <coughs> They're autocomplete to make your search results more targeted, more tailored to your interests. Um, their goal is eventually to make autocomplete virtually telepathic. And I've had experiences with this myself. In the spring semester, one of the classes I was taking, I opened up the syllabus and said, OK, to do this assignment, I need screenshots of the program I'm using. So I went to Google, and I, the words in my head that I was going to type were, how to take screenshots in Mac OS X. I typed how to take, had not even typed the S to begin the word screenshots, and Google pops up with, how to take screenshots in Mac OS X. And I'm like, oh my god, they're reading the syllabus with me. That's not it. <laughs> So let's try, let's try it. If you have your tablet or smartphone or laptop or something with you, um, Eli Marser talked about a particular instance uh, where two friends of his both searched BP. And uh, they got such radically different search results, they might have well been on different planets. One <coughs> got all sorts of information about the oil spill, the other got all sorts of information on investing with BP, and they had virtually no overlap on their first, first pages. And that kind of, kind of worried them. So try searching BP and let's see, see if we get anything different. I get some stock information and I get Bucky's Express Food Shops. <coughs> Anybody want to share what they got? Well, is it? I got career. yeah, yeah. careers. Yeah. Uh, careers. Stock and careers? I got the official site. Official site? Okay. Wikipedia. Wikipedia? <laughs> All right. Area gas stations. Area gas stations? All right. Good start. <laughs> okay, we're getting, getting some stuff. Not so much the oil spill anymore, because it's not the hot topic it used to be. Um, article, uh, Melissa Casbridi, my colleague and I, were, were doing some, some searches just to, to see where, how our results diverse. One, we had a huge diversity on was uh, obesity and bullying. In her case, she'd been doing a lot of research on a particular scholar in that field. And so her search results, every single one of them, featured an article by or about that scholar. Mine, none of them did. And so if you were to look at her search results, you'd think that this was the preeminent scholar, whose name I have unfortunately forgotten. But if you look at mine, you wouldn't think this person was there at all. Um, so obesity and bullying, anybody want to say what they've got? I've got... Uh, on the second page, I had something about boycott. Boycott? On the second page, yeah. Okay. I just get a lot of news, and for, for the obesity and bullying, I just get a lot of news, and then something about children in Dayton, Ohio. Um, I get the children first. You get the children first? That's all that's at the bottom of my first page. So. I get teasing and bullying and obese and overweight children. Okay, yeah. That's what I get. That one didn't show up for me at all. It's from healthychildren.org. That's what I get. And of course, are these kids more vulnerable than bullies? Okay, so we've got some overlap and some not overlap, but it's not as bad as it used to be. And I think part of that is Google has actually been responding to complaints like parsers by trying to introduce more diversity back into their search results. 
they've gotten pretty divergent. And just in the last month, I've actually seen some articles talking about how Google is very deliberately trying to make sure that the important stuff makes it into everybody's search results. So that's one of the points, is that this landscape, this uh, filtering landscape, is changing very rapidly. So there's still filtering going on, but the effects are changing. First one is the government size. N I M N I H Okay. So the N I M N I M yeah. N I M N I H. N I M N I H National Institutes of Mental Health, I think. And and then Wikipedia again. Wikipedia always seems to float to the top of almost mm -hmm. everybody, I think. But is it a problem? I mean even when we do get different search results, is it a big deal? Um, there's a study out there that says that, not the moderates, but the, the far, far left and far right people on either extreme of the political spectrum have so trained their neural pathways to their thought processes that the other viewpoint, whatever it is, goes both directions, looks pathologically insane. They genuinely can't understand how anybody could think that way. And that's on both sides. That's not, it, that's not specific to either party. But there's another um, study that says that the U.S. political divide is today just about as wide as it was four years ago. So even if we do have a big political division, we can't blame the internet for it and we can't blame the filter for it. Now the more I started to read about this, I really started to think there was a big difference between overt filtering and covert filtering. Eli Foster did not make this distinction. He painted all of these companies with the same brush. But I really thought there's a difference between a company like Google or Facebook or Twitter, where you create an account, you, you um, sign in, you click, I agree to some sort of terms of service agreement, their collection and use of your data is largely consensual. Covert filtering now are these companies that mostly control the advertising, that operate behind the scenes, gathering your knowledge from all sorts of sources without your knowledge and consent. Um, if there's any archivists in the room, they do it without confidence. So once that data is in their database, they can't tell you where you got it, and they can't um, verify its accuracy. And um, there's virtually no government oversight of this, although that may change because the government has just started this summer finally looking into it. One of the data brokers, and there are many of them, I'm not picking on this one in particular, except that there's more information about them than any of the others, is Axiom. And uh, the reason that there's more information about Axiom is Eli Parser talked a lot about them. Um, Natasha Singer of the New York Times wrote a great big article about them. Joseph Turo of the Daily U, his book, The Daily U also talked about Axiom. So if you've heard of one of these data brokers, this is probably the one you've heard of. And they have about 1,500 specific points of data on more than 90% of all U.S. adults, plus a slightly smaller percentage of, of adults worldwide. And of course, their, their main goal is to sell it to various companies for the purposes of, of targeted advertising. So from one of Axiom's own presentations to their, to their investors, meet Becky, 37, married, two children, high value, lives in New York. Think about the high value. How do you, how do you think they rate your value? They, they judge people, they rate people based on their purchase history, their creditworthiness, their friends' creditworthiness, and any number of other factors to, to um, gauge whether or not you're worth pitching the good ads to. And they are just one of many, many, many data brokers. There are literally hundreds of these companies operating behind the scenes. And they, they merge, they go out of business on a fairly regular basis, but some of the big ones that seem to be sticking around, and this is sort of like 20 some of them from free sources. Um, the big three credit, uh, credit reporting rates are in the mix, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion. They're part of the, part of the sphere of influence operating there. Um, and one name that really surprised me was, was Reed Elsevier, because of course in libraries we think of them as publishers of academic textbooks and journals. <coughs> But according to Joseph Turo and the Daily U, they also trade in individual persons' data about their credit worthiness. So, who knew? So, a person named Alexis Madrigal decided to do an experiment where she tracked the trackers. She wanted to see who was watching her. Um, and so during a, a day and a half of normal internet usage, she didn't go out of her way to visit any websites that she would normally have visited. She found 105 different companies collecting her data. And she went to the Network Advertising Initiative, which is something that the data brokers have set up to theoretically allow people to opt out, and filled out all their forms and jumped through all their hoops, and discovered then that the only thing that she actually managed to really opt out of was seeing the targeted ads. 
they were still going to collect her data. It was still going to be part of their big database, but she just wouldn't see it yet. Joseph Jerome talked about a similar sort of situation in the Daily View, where if if that's the only tangible benefit you might get out of it, seeing stuff that's more relevant to your interest, but you can't opt out of the, the creepy part of it, why would anyone go to the trouble of opting out in the first place? Um, and then Natasha Singer of the New York Times went a step further and she actually paid Axiom a fee to get a copy of her profile. She's like, well, if I can't opt out, I at least want to know what you know about me. And all they sent her was a list of her previous addresses. They claimed that they could not send her a complete copy of her profile because they couldn't search their database by individual name. Yet, when they sell this data, these data packages to their corporate customers, they include personal data all the way down to names and street addresses. So they just can't give it to people. So there is no way for, for you to review what these companies know about you. So as I say, this is all about targeted advertising. It's all about relevance. They divide people into targets and waste. Um, the algorithms do this behind the scenes. There's not necessarily a, there's not a person they're getting, it's just the algorithms looking at your, your search history and your buying habits and sorting them. And then if an algorithm consistently classifies a person as, as waste for more, more products than not, um, Pam Dixon of the World Privacy Forum pointed out that this could <coughs> over a lifetime add up to a lot of missed opportunities. You know, you don't see you don't see the ads for the good stuff, if you don't know what opportunities exist, you can never dig yourself out of the hole. If you get classified as waste too many times, it's a trap you can't get out of because you never see the way out. So why, why does this continue? Obviously we know companies are making money, that's, why they, that's what they're getting out of it, but what do we as individual users of the system get out of it? Why is, this allowed, you know, why is there no big public outcry? Because it is convenient. It's good to have things sorted. This is not an indictment of humanity. This is not saying that people are lazy. This is saying that there is too much information out there and no one can possibly sort through it all on their own. You have to have some way of getting to the stuff that you care about and reading out the stuff that you're not interested in um, just because there is too much information. And that's um, just a fact of the <coughs> quantities of information that exist. Sundar and Marat uh, did a really interesting pair of studies and they were looking at the idea that there's a difference between customization and personalization. Um, two kinds of filtering. And personalization is, which is where it's controlled by the system. So the algorithm is operating behind the scenes to control what you see. And customization is controlled by the user. This is where you go in and you set your options, you actually click on various buttons and, and um, set up your set of your feeds or set of your parameters. And they found in their first study that power users really preferred customization. They liked that high level of control. Non-power users didn't want to think about it. These are just the ordinary day-to-day -day users. They wanted it easy. They liked the personalization. They wanted the system to do it for them. But in the second study, Sundar and Marat introduced a, big, a strong privacy policy as a variable. And the preferences flipped. Power users looked at that and said, okay, if my data is secure, then why not let the algorithm do some of the heavy lifting? And the non-power users looked at that and said, Ooh, I wasn't really thinking about these issues. I guess I better pay attention and maybe take a little more control of my data. And they started out for more customization. The thing was, though, in both studies, the website that consistently ranked at the bottom that absolutely nobody liked, power users and non-power users alike, were the ones that had no personalization and no customization, no filters in effect. Nobody liked them. So don't expect any kind of public uprising against this kind of filtering and personalization and customization because people do find it useful on average. Um, so libraries are filters. We've always been filters. We call it collection development. Every time you choose to buy one resource and not another, that's, that's a filter. Um, and David Weinberger, author of Too Big to Know, uh, talked about how over the course of about a century, there was a 30-fold increase in print publications in the U.S. alone. That's just print, that's just the U.S. Of course, libraries didn't get that much bigger, so libraries did the only thing that they could do, which is by a continuously narrowing percentage of the total um, works published in the U.S. And they're, you know, by extension globally and, and online, etc. cetera. Uh, so over the course of the last century, the library filter has been getting narrower, and it's 
nothing we can really do about it because we don't have the resources to keep up with the information explosion any more than anybody else does. And that's just the collection side. On the patron side, we still also collect and use patrons' data for all kinds of things, for circulation, um, calendar design requests, sometimes public appears, require logins. We collect people's data for all sorts of things, and we use it for all sorts of things. But the difference between us and those data brokers is we don't sell it, and we don't, we don't share it. We, as a profession, hold privacy as a strong core value. It's in the ALA's Intellectual Freedom Committee. Um, they make a distinction, actually, between privacy and confidentiality. And privacy is the right to open inquiry, that right to research any topic without fear of, of negative repercussion, without fear of persecution. Confidentiality is more like data security. That's more like we have the patron data, we keep it safe, we're not going to sell it, we're, we're, we're keeping it confidential. This distinction is largely un, unknown outside of libraries. When you read privacy policies from all these companies operating on the web, they're talking about what the Library Association refers to as confidentiality. And the concept of privacy as libraries use it, in terms of the right to open inquiry for any topic, is never mentioned. Now, it could be, theoretically, that they might actually do hold that as a value and they just don't feel the need to talk about it. Or maybe not. Um, Eric Schmidt, who was, at the time he said this in 2009, CEO of Google, he's now the executive chairman, so he's still in their top management levels, so that if you have something you don't really want to know about, you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Well, <laughs> that's completely counter to the librarian's idea of the right to open inquiry. Because just because somebody's researching a topic doesn't mean that they're going to go, you know, blow something up. They could be researching anything. They could be, you know, could be a police officer researching something. You never know. Um, that's why we can't, you know, that's why we have to protect people's rights because people look for great information for all kinds of reasons. But obviously Google, at least, um, doesn't hold that as a, as a particular value. Um, ALA's freedom to read statement includes the idea that it's in the best and in the public interest for everybody to have access to the widest diversity of views and expressions, including those that are unorthodox, unpopular, or considered dangerous by the majority. Um, I would say that in this, in this age of uh, filtered internet, you might need to add another category, even the passive life of exposure to new ideas that the filtering creates. Because you can't ask a question if you don't know the topic exists. You now that takes us back to Carl's essential themes that when you're filtered, you don't know what you're missing, you don't know the questions to ask, you can't feel curious about these things. So, in your book with your library, first think about yourself. Think about your own filter bubble, because everybody has one. We all do. Just be consciously aware of it as you're selecting materials for your library. Because I, uh, you don't want your library's collection to look like your interest. You want it to re reflect all of your, <coughs> your patrons' interests, the whole diversity of it. And we all know this. It's just a, it's just a minor reminder. Um, think also about your patrons. As they're coming in with um, this increasingly filtered experience where everything they use on their tablet or their smartphone or whatever is highly customized, highly tailored to their preferences. It's, it's all the stuff they care about and none of the stuff they don't care about. And then they come into the library and they search our databases and our catalogs and when we have relevancy writing at all, it's kind of terrible. <laughs> um, and so they may perceive an undesirable signal to noise ratio. They may look at this and say, well, what's with all these false hits? This isn't what I meant at all. Um, and they may not understand how to search in an unfiltered environment. Um, so that's an education issue. Another thing to consider with patrons is, especially if you're helping somebody remotely, via chat or phone or however, what you're seeing on the screen and what they're seeing on the screen may be totally different, uh, even if you're entering the same search terms into the same search box. So some patrons are going to be so thoroughly filtered that they really don't even know what to ask for. They don't know what they're missing. And that's where the education issue comes in, where you have to help them understand how to search outside the filter bubble and why it's actually important to do that for some topics. But again, everybody's different. Every patron's different. It's not always necessary. Sometimes you can just look at someone's, you know, get them what they need without even having to push the parameters. Unfortunately, there's no right, easy answer because every single person is different. Uh, libraries could perhaps use filters effectively too. Um, Keating and Hafner had an interesting proposal about 10 years ago. I've never seen a library that actually does this, 
But it's an interesting idea, and the technology today actually would make it easier to do now than it would have been when they first proposed it. And this, was a, this one applies more to academic libraries, but the idea was using a student's major to filter their search results based on what other students of that major or faculty in that department have judged to be useful and relevant. That's an interesting idea. If libraries could offer a high level of personalization on the level of Google, you know, you could imagine people coming in and two patrons search for stars, and the new student gets all sorts of resources on astronomy, and the movie buff gets all sorts of resources on the Hollywood stars, and they both feel really happy. But if libraries do move into a feature where we do offer more filtering, more personalization, there are a couple caveats. First, we would have to make it very obvious that this kind of filtering is in effect, because historically we haven't offered it and many of our patients expect us to continue to not offer it. So if we do start filtering search results, we need to let people know. And we have to make it very easy to turn it off for those patrons who don't want filtered results, or patients who do need that privacy and that confidentiality, who don't want to be tracked, who don't want whatever they're searching to be influenced by their past searches or to show up influencing their future searches. One option that exists now is kind of the anti-Google. DuckDuckGo is a search engine. Their whole claim to fame is we don't filter by Google. They even show Eli Parser's book on their About Us page. So there's not much to say about them other than they don't track, they don't filter. So if you have a picture that truly needs that, this is one you can point them to. Another interesting website that might be worth bookmarking and checking back is uh, TOSDR, Trumps and Service Student Read. This is a really new project. This has only been going since this summer, so they don't have a lot of data yet. But they're working on it. And the premise is, people use all these services online, and they just click, I agree, to the serve terms of service without reading them, because you know who wants to read 15 pages of terms of service agreement when you've got five minutes to get a task done? Um, what they're doing is going through and collecting these terms of service agreements and, and going through them carefully and rating the different aspects of them, the different parts of them, as to Hey, okay, this one, this sign is safe to, ah, oh, this is considered that this particular issue matters to you, now to, oh gosh, don't give these people your data. Um, and, and as they get more data, this site will become more useful as a, as a reference to check if, if you're picking a site that you might want to use for library services, or if you're picking a site to recommend to a patron, this could become a, a useful reference tool as it gets more data on the site. Right now we've only got maybe a dozen or so sites reviewed, but it's a start. And of course, think about your library's own privacy policy. You um, shouldn't necessarily expect their patrons to know that we don't buy and sell their personal data, because some people might just assume that you know, every other company out there operating on the web buying and selling my data, libraries probably are too. Um, so make sure you have, have a privacy policy or, or links to the AMA's statements or something in place to show the patrons who are concerned about privacy what we, what we really believe and how we really practice it. And think about uh, what libraries are in a position to do well that the internet at large tends to not do so well. Um, Carl Grant, in an interesting blog post on libraries and, and cloud, talked about the idea of instead of a filter bubble, libraries need to be the learning bubble, where we would make it very easy to click a single link to have uh, an opposing viewpoint or a critical commentary on whatever a person happens to be looking at. We're not there yet, but it might be something to, to build toward, a tool to make. Um, and this feeds into information literacy instruction because information literacy and critical thinking have a fair amount of overlap. Uh, John Wiener did a really neat study where he analyzed 1,600 articles from PubMed and parent databases to see what kinds of concepts information literacy and critical thinking were paired with, to see what's the overlap and what's the difference. And critical thinking turns out to be primarily internal, it's a private process, it mostly happens up here in an individual person's brain, it's learned over many years through experience, whereas information literacy tends to be more public, more community, it's, it's shared information, but when you take you know, outside of that, there's a huge amount of overlap, I mean the Venn diagrams overlap quite a bit, you know, um, and so information literacy instruction can actually be used as a, as a tool to teach the critical thinking skills to help people evaluate these um, information structures and as they encounter them online to better help control their own data. 
and think about things that either could be happening soon or you know in the, in the near near future horizon. Joseph Turow and Bailey, who talked about how news sites already have the technology to alter the headlines and lead paragraphs of online articles to better attract an individual's attention based on their personal preferences. Okay, is that a problem? Well, what if a student cites an article in, in a paper that they turn into their teacher and then their teacher clicks on the link in the bibliography and the title doesn't match? And the, the uh, quote the student used isn't in fact match either. This is just, again, a thing to be aware of. This might be something to, if we, if we have knowledge that a particular news source is doing that, that's the information we can pass on to the students and teachers who use our libraries. And this one's somewhat scarier, but it's not happening really yet, although it is technically possible already to alter the characters and plots and the products the characters using in, in books, in videos, in video games, to suit the readers or viewers, players. Um, it's not widespread because it requires a phenomenal amount of processing power to do this. But think of all the things we do routinely today that 10 years ago would have been completely impossible because of the processing power requirements. <coughs> this is something we might see in the future. So imagine a book club discussion where everybody gets the book on their on their e-readers or their tablets, and they get together and realize they really haven't read the same book. <laughs> so this, again, here's a place where libraries can step in. We can always make sure that we have access to the authoritative source of the text, what the work the author actually wrote. And um, James Weinheimer, who is a cataloger in Rome, talked about libraries as you know, how reliable we are compared to Google. Um, he talked about a reliable selection, so that we get the full range of diversity of opinions, our reliable cataloging, Let's find something the same way and a reliable access so that if something disappears, we still have ways of getting to the information. Um, and in general, just the things that libraries are in a position to do very well that you know we can't outgoogle Google, but we're not playing the same game. So, and to then just stay with the basics, as always, libraries have to continue to develop our collections to the greatest depth and breadth possible within our resources so that we always have something to offer any patron who comes in or comes to our site, no matter how narrow their particular filters are. So this filtering is a permanent part of the information landscape. The exact way it's working is changing rapidly, but in some form or another, it's, it's going to possibly become even more pervasive. And so the main takeaways I'd like to have are just first an awareness of your own filter level. Think about, think about what, uh, these companies probably know about you and how that affects what you see. Understand generally how these things work, and then, mm -hmm. um, then you'll be better able to recognize when your filter bubble and your patron's filter bubble are overlapping at all, so you can figure out how to get to where they are so you can help them most effectively. Um, so there we go. Any comments or questions? That was a great presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How do I change my searching? At first, I got really paranoid and I tried to go in and lock everything down. And then I realized how incredibly inevitable everything was. And I thought all I'm doing is making everything incredibly inconvenient for me. And I'm actually more open about what I let the, let the companies have. My privacy settings are actually looser because I'm like, I can't really escape. So I might as well, you know, that, that thing that Joseph Turo said, why would you opt out if all you're opting out of is seeing the, the targeted search results and you're not able to top, top, totally opt out of the data collection? I was like, well, I might as well get what benefit I can out of it. So I figure if there's something that's going to go catastrophically wrong on a societal level, that you know, I'm not going to be the only one affected. <laughs> go about circumventing like somebody's filter results and patron bridge How would I go about circumventing a patron's filter results? Well, one of the options is simply you know, using an unfiltered thing like DuckDuckGo. Um, sometimes actually the public library computers themselves are good enough as long as nobody's logged into their own Google account or something because those public machines get such heavy used by such a widely diverse group of people that based on their IP there is no coherent filter in effect because they're, it's, it's all scrambled. If someone logs into their, to their account with one of these services, 
then all bets are off because then they can they can get the account level stuff. But if, it, if it's truly a public machine where nobody is logged into any personal accounts, the filters are so scrambled anyway that uh, it won't really match up with the patron's preferences to start with. Um, so provided they're not logged into like whatever their account source is, Yahoo, AOL, mm -hmm. Google. Yeah, sometimes it's just the answer is just log out of everything you can log out of, or go use a computer where they're, they're you know a different computer where you're not logged into anything and nobody else is either. And um, there aren't a lot of really easy ways to get out of this stuff. And also, most browsers do have some kind of private browsing feature. Um, it's called different things in different browsing different browsers, but look for something like a private browsing feature and just turn it on. So go to make sure everything that can be logged out of is logged out of, and turn on whatever kind of private search, private browsing feature. Um, I'm trying to remember what some of the others are called in different browsers, but every every major browser, the, the Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, Safari has something like that. Turn on. Yes. Our library has we're a very university library, and our library has on our Peterson Library program called Decrees which basically every night the computers just scrub themselves clean. And so every morning when those computers come back on, it's like a brand new computer, so there's no search information left from the previous users or any of that. So that's, that's one other way to get around it. That's another good one. She mentioned Deep Freeze as a program that uh, when the computer reboots, it's scrubbed clean and resets its initial settings, so no cookies or anything that's left on it, nothing carries over. Um, I've heard of another one called Centurion. I'm sure there are many others out there. There are probably that can do similar kinds of things. Deepreeze is one of the biggest ones I've heard of, though. Um, so that's another option to make sure that none of these little cookies and other files that accumulate um, carry over. So that's one service that libraries could offer is uh, secure surfing of the web. Yes. It's privacy free, uh, privacy, not privacy free, but the confidentiality. <laughs> Yes. It's secure via um, internet searching, Google or whatever you want to search. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question. Um, in one of your sources, um, one person um, found um, she when she did her searches, she she found that like 105 mm -hmm. others were tracking. How did she know that <coughs> by her searches? I don't know exactly. Oh, okay. She had she had some kind of method for figuring out who all was was watching, and I don't remember her exact methodology. Okay. But you could you could um, go to that yeah. article and, and check it out yourself. What did you say? To to answer that, unfortunately, I can't remember the name of the plugin. But there's a Firefox plugin that you can go to a site. It will then start tracking what everything is tracking in you, and then you can bring up a screen that shows all the connections between the site you're on and other sites and how those are connected. Unfortunately, I just I can't remember the name of the plugin, but search for like you know Firefox privacy tracking plugin or something like that, and I'm sure you can find it. So that's how she knew that she wasn't seeing the ads, but she was still getting tracked because. But she did it again, they were still tracking her. Yeah, I don't know if that's the tool she used, but I know that is a tool that is out there that, that will do that it's, sort of thing. Probably, probably something like that then. Okay. Um, so it could, could have been a, the browser plugin like that <coughs> just described, or it could be the, the maybe other tools that she had access to. I'd have to go back and read the article because I can't remember the methodology off the top of my head. Sorry about that. Um, but yes, the other comment you meant. The, for the for the people of the streaming who may not have been able to hear it in the audience, the other comment he made is this is a service that libraries can offer. If we have something like Deep Freeze in place, that we can offer secure browsing. Um, this is a, a service we have. So, all right. Now, any other questions, comments? Will this be available for us to view later? It, um, recorded or you know what I mean? Will it be able to see this later? Is it providing nothing goes wrong before she's done? Yes, this session has been recorded. <laughs> <laughs> And, and that and, one has the name of the book, and uh, yes, I have actually, a book actually. And actually, uh, um, if you if you email me, I will be happy to send you my bibliography, the full bibliography. It's, it's like two pages, so uh, which you can't possibly read here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd be happy to send this this bibliography to anybody who wants it.
Yes, the Prezi is online and it's public. So if you go and if you just go to Prezi, Prezi.com, and search for Filter Bubble Angela Prager, you'll find it. And it's also on the MPLA site where they put all the, the links to presenters' uh, materials. You can find it there also. Also, he's done a YouTube video. And you can see he did a TED Talk. Mm -hmm. That's how I heard about it. That's why I'm here. Because I thought, oh, that's followed up this guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Same. So, so he does some good TED Talk. Indeed. Yeah, Parser had a very good TED talk, and so I know yeah. the the name of the the Firefox plugin I found it is called Ghostery. Ghost, Ghostery. Yeah. G H O S T E R Y. G H O S T E R Y. Ghostery is apparently the Firefox plugin that will allow you to see who is watching you <laughs> and track, track the trackers, as it were. Um, now, where did you say we could find your presentation? P R E Z I dot com. And you can also find it on the NPLA website. Any streamed videos will be available to the general public two weeks after the conference. Two weeks after the at, conference. At for least. The first at least. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for two weeks, it's available only to the e-conference folks. Okay. After that, it'll be, it'll be published on some other social. Okay. At, at, the, at first, the, uh, the conference, the same as for people who are also recording. At first, the conference, these uh, videos will be available only to those who paid for the paid for the streaming video conference, and then after two weeks or more, then they will be, <laughs> then they will become available to the general public also. Any other questions, comments, observations? Well, I am in the habit to have been for years of clearing my browser at home, mm -hmm. my personal machine. Uh, uh, just, I suppose, it's a matter of some degree of care going on for the years. Uh, you know, but I, I clear all of it, the memory, the history, the, the cookies, everything, to read all those files. But all of this information is collected on the web. So what advantage do you get by doing that on your own machine when all of that information is already out there? You do actually make, if you do delete your cookies and stuff regularly, you do actually make it a little harder for them to track because they do always need some kind of foot in the door to give them new information about you. Um, and so, yeah, if you do if you do delete your cookies regularly and use private browsing, um, you will hamper their ability to collect new information about you. Uh, any others? <laughs>